This paper was done in collaboration with George Fitzmaurice at Autodesk Research in Toronto. It's actually a journal article in the Human Computer Interaction Journal published in 2015. It's uh, 38 pages, so I will do my best to go through the high level details uh, in the next 20 minutes and encourage you all to check out the paper for any additional details that we can't cover in the talk or Q&A afterwards. Just a bit of background, my work has been at Autodesk Research for the last seven or eight years. Autodesk is a company that designs software for anything that you might make or experience in the physical world, such as automotive, architecture, manufacturing, and media and entertainment, such as movies, so design software. As a result, the user interfaces that Autodesk puts out are extremely complex, with hundreds and, in many cases, even thousands of commands. So obviously, they're very complex to use and very complex to learn. So even with a team of very skilled designers and user experience specialists and applying standard usability guidelines, you're still going to end up with complexities in learning. And a lot of my research has been how we can improve software learning for complex user interfaces. In 2009, we published a paper surveying all the research that's happened in, in software learnability and presenting this taxonomy. And we also identified some of the core challenges in software learning that you see here. And both before that and since then, there's been a lot of research in the software learning literature of developing interactive tutorials and community-based systems for improving software learnability. And that also includes research done at our lab at Autodesk you see over the past five years that we've done in interactive tutorials. Now, what's interesting about the majority of this research is it doesn't really consider the level of expertise that a user has, which is somewhat crazy when you think about it. And if anyone was at Alan Kay's plenary this morning, he made some points about this, of how the computer knows so little about the user. So this is a screen capture of someone using AutoCAD. So just put yourself in the mind of the computer. Pretend you're the computer or you're the, universe, you're the user interface watching what this user is doing. And ask yourself, is this user a novice? Are they intermediate? Are they expert? Are they good at some things? Not so good at other things? Right now, the computer doesn't really have a model of that. And we'd like to address that. And there's a lot of features and metrics that you could be collecting from from what's happening here, such as you know, how quickly the mouse is moving, what type of commands they're using, how quickly they access items within, within the menus, what types of high-level workflows. But right now, the user interface doesn't have that model. So it doesn't know if you're an expert, a novice, or other. To the user interface, it's going to present the exact same system to any of these personas. Now, there's been a lot of work trying to address this. So Eric Horvitz has this seminal work on mixed initiative interfaces in the Lumiere project, where he models uh, user, user behaviors and tries to present information at appropriate times. There's also been work in multi-layered user interfaces or training wheels-based user interfaces, where you reveal more functionality to users as they become uh, more expert with the software. And then work by Hearst Hudson and, and Mankoff at uh, this conference in 2007 looked at applying task models, and they adapted the level of help a user would get based on the level of expertise that the user had. But for the most part, these studies were done in lab environments. And the expertise models were developed through repetitive use of a software in a short amount of time, where people could progress from novice to expert um, in, in a fairly short amount of time, whereas in complex software applications, that's going to take months, if not years, to occur. So we sort of looked at the literature and software expertise and came up with what we used as our working definition, which is the characteristic <coughs> skills and knowledge that distinguish experts from novices considered across the entire scope of functionality that the software provides. And with scope, what we mean are the different levels of features and functionality that is within the application. So with UI expertise, we look at just the ability to navigate the user interface, regardless of the commands or task flows. 
And then with command expertise, we look at the scope of all the commands or tools, so individual components that one might use. And then with task ex expertise, we're looking at the capabilities of users to complete higher level, higher level tasks. And for all these metrics of expertise, there's different ways to measure them. So you can measure it by a user's familiarity, their frequency, or their efficiency at any of these levels of scope. And so here's a, a table of sort of the, the different combinations you get. And you can see there's been a lot of prior research that covers a lot of these, a lot of these different areas. So just as an example, you can look at command expertise at the frequency level and maybe define an expert as someone who uses more advanced commands at a very frequent rate. Now these are all low, what we'd call low-level metrics. They're, they're things that could potentially be measured by the computer system. But there's also important high-level metrics to consider when you're thinking about software expertise, such as the appropriateness of the workflows that one chooses, the quality of the content they're, they're actually producing, and the level of domain knowledge that they, they might have. So if we go into actual classification of, of software expertise, there's often models of transitioning from novice to expert, but it's not that sort of simple or one-dimensional, as you've seen from that table I just produced, of uh, these different sort of ways of thinking about what an expert is. So we de developed this sort of framework visualization of, of how you can think about it. So imagine the space of the entire functionality of an application. You can divide this in a couple of ways. In one way, you can divide it about um, how the user uses the functionality. So some proportion they use efficiently, some proportion they might be familiar with, and some proportion they might not even be familiar with. And another way to divide the space is thinking about what percentage of this functionality is relevant to the user versus not relevant. And by doing this, you come up with different sort of assessments of or, or types of expertise that can arise. So for example, this visualization here is what we would call a core expert, because it's someone who's efficient with all the areas of the application that is relevant to them and familiar with others. But there's also something we termed as an isolated expert who only uses the, the commands that, that is relevant to them efficiently and doesn't even know about or potentially care about features that aren't relevant. This is uh, a term we called naive expert, and these have been identified before in the literature, as someone who's very efficient with what they do but isn't aware there's more functionality out there that is quite relevant to the workflows that they carry out. And here's another example what we call knowledgeable expert. And this might be someone in education or product support who's very familiar with the range of functionality that the, the application provides, but not necessarily efficient with it. It's just a different type of, of expert. So with all these different classes, how can we measure expertise? And there's been a number of methodologies that have been proposed. So you can do a self-assessment where people just rank, them, rank themselves as expert. You can have a team of judges or, or experts rank the expertise of other people through observation. You can run laboratory tasks or you can do in situ measurements. And we're, in particular, interested in in, in situ measurements. Because when you, when you think about the features of all these different measurement methodologies, some are easy to perform, some are quite difficult, like you need someone to go into the actual lab. Whereas in situ measurements have the potential that they're completely transparent to the user. It's all happening in the back end, and they're not even aware of it. They don't need to do anything special. <laughs> but the question is, how reliable is it? And that's a question that isn't so clear from the prior literature. So we performed a fairly large scale user study uh, trying to assess expertise, both in situ. And we wanted to know how well can the metrics that I just described be identified, both in situ and in the lab, and which metrics would correlate to an expert judge's assessment. So we sort of consider um, the expert judge's assessment a ground truth. Whether or not that's the case is, is up for, for debate, but it's sort of the best, the best we can do. So we ran the study using, using AutoCAD, which again is a fairly complex software application. It provides both commands for 2D and 3D operations. We, we, actually, we started with 16 participants, but two uh, did not complete the, the study. It was a, a one or two month long procedure uh, because we were instrumenting their, their software in actual use. Uh, and usage of AutoCAD or expertise ranged from 
six months, which sounds like a lot of experience, but in AutoCAD terms, that's actually quite, quite a, a novice level, beginner level, up to uh, 10 years of experience. And we also recruited two expert judges, both who had 10 plus years of professional experience and teaching experience with, with the system. And there were two main phases, but the, the uh, lab phase was divided into separate components. So the in the wild phase, we, we uh, released a plugin that captured all these metrics of what people were doing in their typical everyday use. So we weren't giving them any sort of tasks. They were just using AutoCAD as they normally do. And we uh, collected these in situ measurements. And then we looked at the different methodologies we can do in the lab. So we provided questionnaires and surveys that are sort of the self self-assessment, but then we ran lab laboratory tasks of how quickly can they access different UI components, and we also ran high-level tasks where the experts came in and actually assessed their, their expertise levels. So for data collection, we collected some of the things I was talking about before, such as the commands people are executing, the start and end times of the commands, the UI method they are using to access those commands, uh, and we're also time stamping all of the mouse and keyboard activity. And this was collected for a period of, of two to four, to four weeks. And we asked participants to achieve at least eight hours of working time during that, during that time period. So we'd get um, a good amount of data collected. We then brought uh, participants into our lab to administer the uh, remaining parts of the study. So there was a questionnaire, and this allowed them to provide self-assessments of their expertise levels. You can see the, the bottom question there of how they would rate their own expertise. In, in the, th the third phase, they ranked their familiarity with uh, 500 different commands in Auto AutoCAD. So we chose the 500 most popular commands, and for each one, they had this little interface where they'd just say if they're familiar or unfamiliar, and if they were familiar, they would rank how often they'd use it. We then did a, a laboratory study of UI access tasks. So we did it with both the ribbon and the menu because they're two different ways, uh, primary ways to access commands in, in AutoCAD and measured, basically measured time of how long it would take them to access the construction line command, for example. We get, then gave them very simple elemental tasks using, using a single AutoCAD command. So for example, the trim tool, they'd, give sam they'd be given sample files and they'd have to make the picture look like a picture that was provided on a piece of paper. And we'd track how long it took them to, to complete those tasks and wh whether they completed them successfully. And then the final stage is when we perform the expert assessment. So our team of experts uh, authored four different high-level tasks and observe the, the participants completing that task and rank their expertise levels. So let's move on to the results. First we'll talk about the results that were captured in the lab, and then we'll talk about how they correlate with what we captured in situ. So this is a table just showing the level of expertise that was collected both uh, by the experts and through the, the self-assessment. And the second column is how many years each participant recorded having experience with. And what we did is we reordered the participant numbers uh, in increasing uh, sort order from their overall expert assessment that our judges provided, just for simplicity. And you can see already that it doesn't necessarily correlate with either the year's experience or the, the self-assessed expertise. So right away we see uh, this, this one result that years of experience and self-assessment of expertise levels may be misleading indicators of expertise. Then looked at command distributions that were reported through the self-assessment of which commands, what percentage of commands they're familiar with, what percentage they actually use. And once again, there, there wasn't much of a correlation here. So a strong assessment of expertise does not necessarily require the usage or familiarity with more commands, which talks about some of the talks to some of the classes of expertise we were talking about before. We then look at the results from the UI access tasks, where they had to access items either in the from the menu or the ribbon, and this was separated into three blocks of trials. And what's interesting is you see even for the the more expert users, their skill progressed uh, from the start to the end of that of that study even for the novice users, which shows that even novice users can exhibit expert behavior with, with short-term improvements. Uh, 
And so it's really important to consider long-term learning effects as well. But despite that, there was a correlation, and this reiterates some of the the prior literature that uh, has been presented before, that UI, UI access time is an indicator, or can be an indicator of an expertise level. And it had a significant correlation with the expertise ratings. One of the strongest indicators of expertise was from the command task that we provided, so when they had to use a single command to complete a task. And we provided a, we calculated a completion score. So if they completed a task successfully, they'd get a one. If they were almost, you know, almost there, they got 0.5. And if they didn't make much progress, they uh, got a zero. And that completion score had a, a fairly strong correlation to the overall assessment of expertise. And that provides a really important lesson that command efficiency is a really good candidate for software expertise. So let's move on to the results from the in situ data. So here is an overview of the type of features that we were collecting from the in situ analysis, such as uh, how many usage hours were collected, the unique number of commands that they, they used. Uh, we also looked at things like how often they use undo and erase. That's been proposed before as a potential indicator of, of classes of expertise. And we looked at the menu access type type and also the um, types of um, UI that they use to access, access uh, commands. So first, the um, command distribution of the unique number of commands that they use from the usage logs. And there wasn't a correlation here. And what you can see is there's sort of two level, two groups of what you might call outliers. And that first group is what we would call those isolated experts who had really strong expert assessments but don't use as many commands. So they're probably those that just focus on the areas of the application that they are most relevant to them. And then we'd have what we'd you know, probably term as a knowledgeable expert who used almost the, mo- the most number of unique commands across all the users but had a much lower uh, overall expert assessment. So it shows that the number of the, the nature of commands that a user uses does not necessarily correlate to expertise levels. When we go back to command efficiency, so how uh, quickly they're uh, completing commands, and this is from the in situ data, we do get a correlation to expertise. And this is a really interesting and important result. Because once again, we had no model of what sort of tasks people were doing, how complex the work was doing. But just looking at how long, for example, it took them to trim something or extend a line. Um, was an indicator of expertise level. So command efficiency could be measured in situ and used as an indicator of expertise. Another metric we looked at that's been proposed before is how often users pause within their their (coughs) workflow. So if there's no keyboard or mouse activity for a short amount of time, that's counted as a pause. And there's a metric of number of pauses per command. And that had a weak correlation to the overall expert assessment. If we go back to the UI access times, so how long it took them to access UI commands, we measured that in situ as well. And once again, it had a a correlation to expertise levels, but not a strong one. And again, we sort of see one potential outlier there. And when we look further at at P12, this is someone who had um, a high high expertise level, but wasn't as efficient with, with the menu access. We found that it's someone who didn't really use the menus very often. And again, remember, in AutoCAD, there's multiple ways to access a command. So um, it shows us two important things. One is that you can potentially use menu access times or UI access times to assess expertise. But it's really important to also consider for each particular user what their typical UI access methodology is. So I'll just summarize with some key results. So menu access times only had a weak correlation with the overall expert assessment. Performance with individual commands in the lab study exhibited the strongest correlation we saw overall throughout the whole study. Command completion times in situ also correlated to the overall assessment. And this is one of the important results from our work is that it shows software expertise can potentially be measured in situ. And that the, the number of pauses also had some correlation to overall expert assessment. So we'll just wrap, wrap up quickly with some discussion. What are some of the design implications? Well, I talked about it before. There's adaptive UIs, adaptive help systems 
But also there's opportunities for community-based learning. So imagine on a discussion board, instead of getting an answer from someone who might have a badge because they've answered many questions before, you could see a, a, an icon or representation of what their actual expertise level is. And there's also opportunities for software companies to measure the expertise of their users and understand how they're progressing, especially if new learning materials are provided. And there's also opportunity for organizations who have a bunch of users all using the same software to potentially measure the expertise level of their users. So future work, we'd like to you know, generalize the results, obviously beyond AutoCAD, because the, the study was restricted to that, and also look at other types of tasks, larger participant pools. And by going to larger participant pools, we can start to build machine learning classification models that could apply some of this knowledge. And we'd also like to look at this issue of, of domain knowledge. What do people know about, not necessarily the software, but the domain, in the case of AutoCAD, it would be architecture. So with that, I'll wrap up and take any questions. Thank you.